put their names on the mutual recognition treaty. Tell us in English, have you signed the letter, yes, sir? Yes, we have signed it. Thank yes. you. Just hours after PLO leader Yasser Arafat signed the mutual recognition agreement, Israeli Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin added his name to the accord. It's an historic moment that hopefully will bring about end to 100 years of bloodshed, misery. What we are trying seriously is to get rid of a poisonous past and to use a biblical wish to return to a land of milk and honey. Outside the meeting, hundreds of right-wing Israelis denounced the agreement, with some saying it would never bring peace to the region. I'm opposed to this agreement because it's not leading to peace, it's leading to a future war. There were also demonstrations on the Gaza Strip, where Hamas extremists vowed to continue their war against Israel. And despite death threats against Yasser Arafat, many Palestinians took to the streets in praise of Arafat, recognizing his achievement in forging the accord, which might bring Palestinian self-rule to the occupied territories. The next step for the two sides comes Monday at a White House peace signing ceremony. Right now, it doesn't look as though the major players in the signing, Yitzhak Rabin and Yasser Arafat, will attend. But today, President Clinton called on several former U.S. presidents to take part in that ceremony. And so far, Jimmy Carter and George Bush have agreed to be there. Jack? Well, signing a peace treaty is one thing. Being able to live together in peace after decades of hostilities between the two people can be quite another. Mark Mooney reports now that many risks lie ahead for Israel, for the PLO, and for the United States. Israel did it with the stroke of a pen, recognizing the PLO and Yasser Arafat. So, why shouldn't the United States? I have decided to resume the dialogue and the contacts between the United States and the PLO. Dialogue is a modest first step. The White House still nervous about lingering suspicions in the U.S. Congress about the PLO. But there's hopeful talk from some of Israel's most ardent supporters. Everybody's going to look to the United States as being the principal guarantor. There's also hope that solving the Palestinian problem could start a domino effect of peace breaking out over the region. It provides substantial impetus to further progress in the Middle East peace talks. The Camp David Accord between Israel and its biggest Arab neighbor, Egypt, was one kind of breakthrough, but the agreement to be signed Monday is different, or so says David Halevi, who's watched Israel's chances for peace go up and down like a yo-yo for 30 years. Now with the Palestinians, we share everything. When they cook food, I smell it. When I cook food, I smell it. The only problem was we were not able to share it. Some opponents of the plan say the devil is in the details, but perhaps the devil has been overcome in the crucial detail of mutual recognition. Israel has a right to exist, and Palestinian Arabs have a right to some real estate in the neighborhood. Now we have established that there is a national identity, hence there are national rights. In Washington, the spectrum of opinion about the diplomatic breakthrough spans widely, from optimism that with peace perhaps Israel can become the economic dynamo of the region, like Hong Kong is in Asia, to despair that Hamas will murder Arafat within a few months of the signing, an assassination pleasing to both radical Arabs and extremist Jewish settlers who want to take us all back to square one. In Washington, Mark Mooney, Channel 11, News at 10. And reaction to this historic pact is pouring in from all over the world tonight. World leaders praising the two sides for achieving what few had thought possible. Barry Cunningham takes a look now at why it's happening now. These of the Middle East suddenly become friends. After wishing each other dead for three decades, a lot has changed in the past two years. Mideast experts say PLO chairman Yasser Arafat made a strategic mistake in siding with Saddam Hussein in the Gulf War. That antagonized the Saudis, who cut off his money supply from the Gulf states. With no more Soviet Union to help him out, Arafat realized he had a bigger enemy than Israel, Islamic fundamentalists in his own ranks. The Palestinian struggle was reduced to teenagers throwing rocks at Israeli soldiers, the Intifada. The 1991 Madrid peace talks, begun by the Bush administration, had raised expectations, but no results. And Yasser Arafat was looking for his place in history. Arafat uh, thought he might miss his chance of leadership if he doesn't do something dramatic now. On the Israeli side, there was a grudging admission that the grungy-looking Arafat, despite his scraggly appearance, is the true representative of the dreams and aspirations of the world's six million Palestinians. We discovered that the Palestinian delegation was in a state of disarray, 
that the Palestinian delegation couldn't deliver the goods and that we had to talk to those who could deliver the goods. Israeli Ambassador Colette Avital doubts that right-wing demonstrations in Israel will undermine the peace agreement. A lot of taboos are breaking down, that all of a sudden you speak to the enemy, somebody who's been set to destroy you for so many years. This has been a conflict with the Palestinians that has lasted for a hundred years. So you can't expect the Israeli public to accept that easily, that from today to tomorrow, uh, Arafat has become not a foe but a friend. Some analysts even talk of Palestine, Israel and Jordan joining in a high-tech business and manufacturing partnership, becoming an economic powerhouse in the Middle East. At the United Nations, Barry Cunningham, Channel 11, News at 10. Deja vu with the World Trade Center today. Hearts stopped beating for a moment when smoke began filling one of the Twin Towers. A partial evacuation was ordered and memories of February's bomb blast flashed through people's minds. But fortunately, as Valerie Coleman tells us, it all turned out to be much more smoke than fire. It was only a small paper fire in a closet on the 59th floor in the number one tower of the World Trade Center, but it caused a lot of smoke, some emotion, and a lot of commotion as emergency units converged on the scene. There was never any question but that this was a relatively minor fire that could be well and easily handled, and that's what it turned out uh, to be. The emergency uh, systems that the Port Authority had uh, worked so hard to install after the terrible tragedy of February 26th, uh, seem to have worked to a T. The uh, 59th floor, the 60th floor, and the 58th floor were evacuated. Announcements were made to the tenants that, in fact, there was an odor of smoke. The fire department was on the scene, that there was nothing really to be concerned about, and that we would advise them later. There were no injuries. The EMS did respond to full disaster complement based on the initial reports of numerous injuries. We're very pleased that we didn't have to put any to work. This looks a lot worse than it is, but given the fact that the World Trade Center fire and explosion is still very fresh in the minds of these workers, it's understandable that even though they've been assured that things were under control, a lot of people felt out of control. I could smell it. It was like we were coming down the first time. The smoke, how could you forget that? You could live to be a hundred, you can never forget that. <laughs> It was mostly the scare of it today compared to the reality of last February 26th. There was total chaos on 26th, it really was. This is really mild compared to that. The big difference is we were able to communicate with them over the PA system and allay their fears, let them know we're on the scene, we let them know the fire's out. It's, it's a world of difference. A little more than an hour after arriving, the 22 fire trucks, 125 firefighters, and dozens of other emergency vehicles that converged in front of the World Trade Center began packing up there was no evidence that the fire was of suspicious origin. In Lower Manhattan, Valerie Coleman, Channel 11 News at 10. Meanwhile, the Justice Department is offering a $2 million reward for information leading to the capture of another suspect in the World Trade Center bombing. The February 26th blast killed six people, injured a thousand more, and stunned the city. The latest fugitive, Abdul Rahman Yassin, is thought to have fled to Iraq, along with one other suspect who also has a price on his head. Both are described as, quote, extremely dangerous. Meanwhile, the four suspects under arrest on the blast go on trial next week.